So what I thought we'd do this time is invite our presenters up, our three presenters. They'll sit here, and they're going to have a conversation. So they're not going to speak individually, they're going to have a conversation. And what I've asked them to think about is to sit here in conversation and help us think about the future. There's lots of young people in, the, in this room who are thinking about the future and will have to you know, apply their own leadership to make the change. So as, you're t as they're talking about the future, and I'm giving them a five-year limit, what's going to be happening in five years? So we'll put some constraints on it. And while they're talking, uh, you can stand in front of the microphones and interject your questions or comments or be part of the conversation. Okay? And we'll do that for probably, I'd say what, 40, 45 minutes. Okay? And then we'll head to the reception. Presenters, please, please join us. jump right in. Okay. Howdy. I've got a question. I'm over here to your right. Um, so I'm really curious what your thoughts on are on how we can, we as the people, we talked about democracy and systems and collective action, and those kinds of things, how we can really defeat, you know, these global powers, um, you know, and uh, there's a lot of tension and, you know, how, do we just go to St. Louis and kind of like ransack Monsanto? Like what, what are some effective practical actions we can take to kind of counteract these um, large powers and transnational ag industrial agri-food? Agri I, I think uh, these last two days are an example. We, we've been talking about democracy and food and health and bringing together a different sector of people. So I think we need to be doing more of this. I think uh, universities have both an opportunity and a responsibility to bring people together, including people from outside the academy, including people from uh, labor organizations and uh, food organizations and poor people's organizations to bring about uh, a different interchange of ideas. I also think uh, we need to make a much more determined effort to take back public space. I think one of the really uh, unfortunate trends of the last few decades has been how much of our public space has been invaded by corporations. Everything from advertising to uh, school food to uh, other things. And we need to take that space back, uh, make it protected space. I'd like to see commercial free zones in schools and community centers and parks. And once we can have space, those are then great places for talking about democracy uh, and starting to bring people together, uh, especially across uh, the many different sectors we've been talking about. So those are a few ideas. I turn it over. Yeah. To um, I, I was thinking a question like that would come up, and it rem reminded me when I was at UVM, um, I was protesting a, the Seabrook uh, nuclear power plant, and we all got arrested and went to jail and so forth, and um, got back, and I got a letter in the mail, just a little card from my grandfather, and it said on it, Dear Roz, you can't fight progress. Love, Gramps. You know, and I thought, oh, yes, I can. You know, uh, and, you know, and I've thought about it in terms of um, fighting progress with knowledge and perseverance and my response would be to just outsmart the others make them obsolete i mean what i see around me say in the silicon valley is just an absolute transformation in our whole technology sector and so forth these are 20 year olds you know just coming up with different ideas of conveying information and knowledge and um, and thinking about things, and, and I think there's so much creativity that I've heard over the past two days, rather than try to get, you know, get the, uh, get your teeth into the pant leg of this Monsanto, just outsmart them, come up with better ideas that are going to be more successful and more profitable, more engaging to this next generation. 
and um, you're already seeing it in Vermont. What's engaging is what you're doing, right? So um, that's how I would, I would think about it positively as well, just, just proceed on with that. Well, I'd like to follow up on both of those comments. I think they're very perceptive. And in, in terms of democracy, I think it's um, significant that here we are talking about democracy in a country which prides itself on being one of the primary democracies on the planet. Um, so clearly it's not a democracy which is working for everybody, right? Uh, Francis Moore LePay calls this a corporate democracy. And I think part of the problem is, is, is precisely that we've lost our public sphere, our public, our public space. And where we, where we don't let the market make decisions because markets aren't free. There is no free market. These markets are all owned and they're all controlled by whoever has the most market power. And that's none of us here, I'm pretty sure. So well, the only way we can fight that is to reestablish the public space which has been essentially taken away from us. Decisions have been taken away and they've been given to the market. This has all been legislated. This hasn't been an accident. This hasn't been natural evolution. Um, it's part of, the, part of the phase of liberalization of the system. So I completely agree that we have to um, take back public space, but we also have to popularize the democracy, not any democracy. If we were to have to vote today um, on what kind of food system uh, this country should have, I'm pretty sure fast food would win. Um, <laughs> And for, because of the way the, the, the voting system is set up and because of the lack of information and because of the lack of options which people have. Um, and quite frankly, people can't always vote in favor of their best livelihood choices. Like if you, if you live in a food desert, for example. I mean, you can't really vote with your fork. There's no polling station. Um, so I think that, that uh, that popularizing democracy, a different kind of democracy, a democracy that I'm sure people in Vermont are uh, quite familiar with at the, at, the, uh, at the town level, right? Th that's the type of democracy that helps us to control um, the food system where we can control it. But I also think, so that's part of construction. Um, but I also think that change comes about through construction and protest. Because you can't just construct because someone else will come along and destroy it for you. Um, and so uh, we also do have to protest and we have to organize for protest. Um, I think we do have to th sink our teeth into Monsanto's pant leg. Uh, it's not enough just to build up a local food system. Um, you won't be able to protect it unless you also um, help to dismantle um, those aspects of the corporate food regime which destroyed the, the public sphere to begin with. So I think we, we really do have to do both. Hi, I'm Nancy Small. Um, I've been in uh, publishing, print and digital, and in marketing, particularly direct response marketing, for most of my career. And one of the things that's kind of struck me um, over the course of these last couple of days is I don't hear any talk about using kind of traditional media um, to kind of get the word out. So I mean, we're all working really hard. You're, you all are amazingly smart and doing great work. Um, but those that we're competing with or against are using all those traditional media um, and they're, they're going further than that. They're using uh, reality TV, they're using the digital media that we probably don't use on an everyday basis like Vine and Pinterest and they're using gaming and, and things like that. You know, they're, they're putting movies together like Frozen about girl empowerment. And, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on taking an approach that's almost more sort of what is today mainstream in terms of helping others get on board and maybe by making it more entertaining or fun in addition to educational and informative. So uh, I think that's a, a, a really important decision. I would say the f first a caveat and then the endorsement of exactly what you said. The caveat is increasingly uh, the media is owned by the same corporate consumption complex as the food industry and uh, so many other industries. So it's not neutral playing ground. Uh, it's it's uh, owned by people who are opposed to some of the things we've been talking about and they will use their ownership and control to uh, either distort or not present those points of view. 
But that said, I think another tendency uh, of the last decade or so has been this burgeoning of, uh, of just a, a whole new variety of uh, media forms. Uh, in in uh, my book, I used a lot the investigative journalism outfits, ProPublica, mm -hmm. Center for Public Integrity, and many others. And I think there are many places that are doing great reporting on the food industry. Reuters investigative unit did a great report on the food industry lobbying against voluntary standards about a year ago. There was a really important story that got into the mainstream media. Uh, uh, public radio has also done some very good food reporting. So we need to be supporting that. Uh, I think a lot of people get their news these days from the internet and there are a variety of uh, media forum and we all ought to be using those to reach out to people and to engage with people. And we need to be talking to people because there's no substitute for people talking to other people in their town, in their community, in their school, in their workplace. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not as much the popular media, but the doc, some of the um, film festivals have such phenomenal films that really are shorter and that really, really resonate and then go out into the marketplace and, I mean, into uh, other communities and on TV and things like that. And I'm not an expert in this, but I am certainly affected by it. And I think it's a really good point to be able to use use these different uh, forums because some people are just much more visual. They won't read and uh, listen to the radio as much. Well, I, I, I agree with you that we have to use all these forms of media. And I, what was the Chipotle series about the exploding cow? What was the name of that? The what? Well, yeah, Farmed and Dangerous. That was hilarious. I, I, I think that, um, no, I think we have to do that. I mean, we have to do things which are, which are funny, which poke fun, which um, see the irony in things and take things, what is you know, truly an absurd food system, really expose its absurdity. Right? And um, I, uh, you know, we need to do more of that. We need no more novels. We need uh, you know, all, all this stuff. And I, I think there's probably all kinds of niches and nooks and crannies where, where that can happen. Um, and if it, uh, you know, if it's well done and, and it's it's clever enough, and it, then it's going to get the airtime. Yeah. Um, so. No, thank and you. I think f both books and uh, and documentary films have played a really important role in the food movement. Uh, Michael Pollan's books, uh, Marion Nessel's books, uh, Fed Up is the latest uh, documentary out that people are talking about. Uh, some of the earlier ones, Fast Food Nation. So I, I think they're. Uh, the popularity of the ideas of the food movement has been in part by effective use of media, uh, many different kinds of media. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. And, and I'll, I'll just leave with a parting thought, though. But when I was um, running Eating Well, uh, what we found that when we were doing really scientific um, reporting, that we were reaching kind of the, we were, we were preaching to the choir, and our readership wasn't particularly growing. And we were, you know, a commercial success, but on a small scale. And as we began to kind of change up some of our standards, make things a little more accessible, a little easier, a little more fun, that we were able to go, go a little deeper into the audience that we were trying to reach. So I think of examples like Elton John and AIDS and Trudy Styler and the organic movement. And, and I, just, I just wonder if we shouldn't think about, in addition to all the great work that um, Michael Pollan and others have, have published, Think about ways to reach segments of the population who aren't there yet. It could be fiction for children even. It could be young adult readers. I mean, I, I just think that maybe there's something more than kind of just getting the facts out and creating our, our strategies um, to, to find different doors for people to be able to enter, to begin to come in and understand what a, a food system even is and why they should care. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sherry Breen from the University of Minnesota Morris, and I want to thank all of you for the uh, talks you gave over the last two days. I've learned a lot at this event, and I'm really glad I've been here. I want to pick up on the discussion about democracy and tie it back to a comment that was made in the opening remarks yesterday, and that's about the importance of discussion and conversation. And I think one of the 
benefits of this event is that there are some differences of opinion here, and I think the conversations we've had, not just during the formal, the, the um, scheduled talks, but during the breaks have been extremely helpful. Um, but we, those of us who care about food systems and who care about participatory democracy, and democracy in the sense of being discursive, being discussion-based, are not immune from the danger of hubris, of thinking that we have it right, of, of being pompous about what we believe. And so I think this is a caution we need to keep in mind, that being open to discussion, being, being always willing to engage in conversation, including those with whom we disagree, uh, and, and remaining both a combination of, I think, ferocity, because I think being ferocious about what we believe is, is essential, but so is the cautionary um, uh, uh, watching out for being pompous about it. And so my question, after there's my, my, my pitch, my question is how do we go about maintaining both ferocity and watching out for being pompous or heavy, being prone to hubris in, in moving forward? Because I think that conversation is essential to being able to, to gain ground. And I'm curious whether any of you have some ideas about the experiences you've had, the organizations you're working with, the kind of research you're doing, and how we can move forward that way without falling into those kind of traps. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up in a small town and then I lived in, a, in villages for about 20 years in Latin America. And one of the things I learned uh, was, especially in the village, but then I, on reflection I realized this was also true of the small town that I grew up in, was that um, nobody really had any real power, any structural power. No, no one had much money. No one had much power over anybody else. And we were all depend interdependent and very dependent on everybody else. And even the very poor villages that I lived in in Latin America, um, no one would, it was unheard of for anyone to die of hunger, to, for anyone to really any, go hungry. No one ever went hungry. And these were very, very poor villages. And there were times where there wasn't much food, but nobody went hungry. Everybody, no one would ever let anybody else go hungry. And I say that because um, when we're talking about dialogue and discussion and whatnot, I think we also are talking about interdependence. And, um, you know, no one could be terribly hubristic in the village because no one else was going to listen to them. They just walk away. Or what we, if you kept it up, then would people start laughing at you. And once people started laughing at you, you know, you really had to stop because if you didn't, then pretty soon there was a stigma attached. Oh yeah, that's the one who always says such and such, or who always tries to do such and what such, or who thinks they're better than everybody else, or whatever. And so, you know, people generally avoided trying to lord it over each other and avoided conflict to a tremendous degree because you had to live with each other. So you're gonna get in a fight today and then tomorrow I gotta look at your ugly face. And you know, we can't, we can't live like this. And, and actually, I may need you to help me harvest or, or whatever it might be. So it seems to me that below the, the, the need for respective discussion, respectful discussion and discourse is a need to reestablish our interdependence. Mm. And that's the very positive thing I, I see about the trend towards local food systems is that they can't work um, simply on a monetary basis. You know, they have to work on the basis of mutual aid and goodwill as well, and those are the things um, I think that will ultimately save us from this corporate food regime, if anything will, and lays the foundation for a respectful relationship which then um, ensures a, a respectful discussion of the issues. So, um yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I agree with you. I, I really am glad that you raised this issue, and I definitely agree with you. I think that um, 
a lot of us have maybe become less good listeners over time, and we don't listen as much as we talk, you know, and I think it's really, really important just to, to listen, you know, uh, to people that aren't like us, you know, and one of the assignments I think that's important uh, for everyone is, is, okay, we're surrounded by people we kind of all agree on what we'd like to see in this world in terms of food systems. Um, but go put yourself in a really uncomfortable position. Get out of your comfort zone. Just go, you know, take your knowledge, your, um, your ethics, and um, your goals, and, but keep them. But just plop yourself into where you're in the minority and not in a very comfortable position and listen and try to have that dialogue. I think it's really instructive. I mean, in these villages, I know that Eric had to do this, but villages are, tend to be more homogeneous too. And how do you, you know... I, I just don't think we're going to get past it without having a, a real discussion either. I really like Chuck's comments, and um, and I, I think we're we're all more have a more tendency to just become polarized in our views, and I think it's really a dangerous point to be in. Two short thoughts to add to my colleagues' comments. One is I, I think we need to learn better ways of having respectful conflict. I think especially in the uh, academy and in so-called polite society. The notion is you don't disagree and you don't have uh, principal debates in public, but I think many of the advances that come about in food and in public health come about because of ideas clashing and people disagreeing. And, and so I think we need to come to the belief that conflict is a good thing and you can have conflict that is respectful where someone has a different point of view and you say why you think that's wrong and then they answer that. I, I don't think we have very good uh, track record of doing that. Uh, and the second thought is for those of us who have privileges by being in institutions that have resources, we need to think of ways of how can we use those privileges to bring into the uh, political arena, into the policy debates, voices that have been traditionally excluded. You know, how can we create spaces to widen the discussion, to widen the democratic discussion, so that it isn't just that narrow band? Um, the, uh, your answers to that last question really set yourselves up to my question, I think, beautifully. <laughs> I was trying to figure out, I've been driving these folks around for a couple of days and visiting with them and seeing them interact. Um, so I would like to know uh, basically three things. Um, we, we, we brought you in, we invited you in because you were coming in from different vantage points. And so from those vi uh, different vantage points, you, you've given us your thoughts. And as uh, Nick just said, you know, sometimes we can have conflict. So I would like to know a little bit from each of you of what, what is something you've learned from uh, hearing your fellow keynoters or from the panelists that were here today um, I want to know something that you heard, uh, but you may not have agreed with, and maybe why, you know, from your perspective, um, um, uh, what that, that potential problem is. And, um, and third, um, uh, still be friends when you uh, uh, leave the podium after this. So that, that's my, uh, that's really the first two. And the third one, I know you're all living in the same community and uh, you, you'll still talk to each other after. So. What, what you've learned and, and maybe what you're, you're questioning or maybe disagreeing with, uh, with what someone else said in the, in the presentations. Do you mean just the keynote presentations? No, any of them. Everything, okay. Anything. So I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> jump into this in uncomfortable silence. <laughs> I, I do that a lot. Uh, so I think this is a question and challenge to the uh, Vermont food movement or the Vermont food system crowd. It's so impressive to my mind how uh, the connections you've made with each other and the, uh, the breadth and depth of your engagement with different parts of the food system. But being a brash New Yorker uh, and, and having the political analysis you heard, I think there's some, uh, there's some enemies of a good food system. And I think there's uh, 
a need for a power analysis and who are the opponents of a more just, more sustainable, healthier food system. And I wonder if you all have thought about that and how you can come together on defining who those opponents are and looking to put together the power that will uh, contest their power and their ability to shape, you know, not only your food environment, but food environments around the world. So, so what are you doing to get to that point? And is that something you think about at night or talk about in your town meetings or in some of the other venues that you're in? And I, I guess uh, I have learned so much since I've been here. I have to say, I mean, I'm so impressed with how um, how a, a single state and, and local communities can um, be so cohesive and galvanized in this way that is so much more than I thought it was before I came here. But from Eric and from Nick, this um, sense of this lumpy tent that got all these interests, but this collective action problem, um, can we solve it? I mean, I, I've really, from Eric's comments and Nick's comments today, I've really been struggling over how do you deal with this collective action problem. So it's kind of following on from Nick's comments, and I think that would be the um, issue we, we would want to <laughs> try to sort out here because having a real voice and a action going forward to revolutionize is going to require that uh, collective action problem to be solved. And it always exists. I mean, this goes back to this Manker Olson's work on collective action a long time ago, where you know the producers have a more singular incentive and can organize much more easily than much more diverse environmentalist consumers, you know, grower, you know, small growers, you know, and so forth. And so the challenge is really large, and I think it's possible um, to do it. The disagreement I would have is that I think there's a lot, just um, so much um, uh, singular focus on the weight on corporations and not enough focus on our policymakers, whether they're local, uh, regional, national, or whatever. And I think the reason why corporations can get as much mileage as they do is because often policymakers really benefit from this and provide the incentives and set it up for this to happen, you know. And I don't think we're really um, making policymakers as accountable as they should be. And I see this all over the world. You know, uh, Richard um, Donovan mentioned the Bupatis. This would be a very localized kind of leader in Indonesia. And Indonesia decentralized all its decision making so that the local, uh, uh, local regional districts could have more control over their resources. But then the corruption just went right into that domain. And you, know, you get these small bupatis that are uh, messing everything up too in some cases and other bupatis are being great. So I think we need to you know, really broaden the connection of, of what's driving this. You know, because a lot of times countries will invite corporations in because they want that extra taxation funds. They, you know, they see that as a stabilizing macroeconomic force in their economies or whatever. I mean, I, so I think the culpability goes broader than just the corporations. Same time, you know, how do you set up incentives to really rein things in? No one's really talked about campaign finance reform, but if we don't get that done, we're never going to actually solve this problem, right? I mean, that's got to be just a first priority in this country, I think. So that would be my disagreement. Um, well, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of sort of uh, technical things I've learned here because this has been such a diverse conference and diverse panels and things that uh, in areas of the food system that I don't have much competency. And so I was um, very interested to hear uh, from the panelists, primarily. I, I, I really got a lot out of the panels. Um, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go sort of one, well, I learned this from this person and that from that person, you know, I mean, kind of go down the list. But to me, it was, it's very enriching, but in an overall, what I think I learned here is, um, you know, I guess, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't clear, clearly we wouldn't be having a conference like this in this type of a conversation. And what's really struck me, I think I mentioned at the beginning of my talk about this conference, is, is the tremendous convergence here of, very, of, of different interests um, that um, 
one doesn't see that much. I remember getting, beginning to see, perhaps, but um, so I, that's to me that you know, all the different facets of the food system in many ways are represented here and people with tremendous um, will to converge, to come together, to try and do something together. And this is supposed to be such an individualistic society and state and whatnot, and yet what I've seen, you know, what I've learned is that that isn't an obstacle um, if you have a common goal or common objective, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, localizing and, and um, taking back control over the food system. Um, it's not that I disagree with what we're doing, but sometimes um, I think I, I feel that we've sort of, we've, we've bit off what we, what we can chew, and that's not a bad thing to do. However, um, we've entered into this through the, the lens of the food system, but we're really talking about systemic change. We're not just talking about food. So we're talking about changing everything. <laughs> but that's very difficult to say. Um, but uh, that's there in the back of all of our minds. We know that, and I think you alluded to this also when you said, you know, we've got to make um, alliances with other sectors and whatnot. It, this really is much bigger than just food and localizing food. Um, I would say it's a, that's a nodal point in terms of, the, and certainly an emblematic area of work in terms of uh, transforming our political and economic system. But um, I guess the, the critique I would have of us is uh, to be careful not to, not to um, insulate ourselves from the rest of the trajectories of social change, which are happening. I mean, his, if, if one takes a longer historical view, we really see things beginning to change. History is on our side. Um, and so I would, I guess my critique is that w do we have better ways of, of reaching out and understanding and building alliances um, with the other forces for social change, um, which we will all need um, in order to even change the food system. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a student from Skidmore College. And actually kind of touching off of that, um, Eric, you had mentioned earlier that for political reform, um, we need to generate more political will. And I guess I was wondering, that kind of made me think about reform versus revolution and just noticing the subtitle of this conference, um, the necessary evolution or is it revolution? And I guess I was just interested in your thoughts on what is the difference between reform, revolution, evolution, and where are we in that picture? Um, and I guess, does it matter in terms of building that political will? Um, like, where do you see us, and does it matter what terms we're using, um, and how, who's therefore involved in the picture? Yeah. Well, I'd be interested in hearing what you guys have to say about that as well. <laughs> I, I, I'll talk to you, but I, I want to hear yeah, from yeah. my colleagues first. So the, the uh, it seems to me the terms we choose have to take into account the political moment. And we need to be thinking both what about the opportunities we were asked to think about the next five years and a very different set of opportunities that might come up in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And you know, I came of age politically in the 60s and in the late 50s and early 60s it looked like uh, America was stuck in Leave it to Beaver. And in a very short amount of time, uh, yeah, you might not know who that was, uh, a, a very uh, traditional middle class uh, constrained world. And in a very short amount of time, at the uh, national level from the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the global level from the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements, suddenly, you know, revolution was much more in the air in many places around the world. So uh, we don't know what the next decade will bring. But looking at the United States today, the uh, polarity that I feel more comfortable with is incremental change versus transformative change. And I like the 
distinction between you know, reformist, uh, transitional, and transformative. And I think those are the questions we need to be thinking about. And I don't, I don't think it makes sense to think of them as a binary or a polarity. We need all those things, but in thinking about the transitional changes, to my mind, we need to be asking, well, what are the transitional changes that will lead us to transformative changes? You know, what are the questions we ask? What are the social forces we can bring into play that will make it possible that the smaller changes we get today become the tipping points for bigger changes tomorrow? So I don't know if that speaks directly to your question. I think we could have a whole much more specific question about what does that mean around food? So one of the things, to repeat something I said earlier, I think having a, a common goal of building a public sector in food, that is both a transitional change that has the potential to be a transformative change. And I think it would make a lot of sense for those of us in the food movement to be thinking about all the things we could do wherever we're working to grow and expand and make more robust a public sector in food. Yeah, these, these guys are so much more eloquent in their, uh, how they say things. But um, I, the, I, love, <laughs> I love the R evolution. I thought that was really creative here. And, um, and on the evolutionary side, I, I agree with Eric. I mean, I think that things have really been evolving quite quickly in this food area. You know, in two, a decade ago, 2004, I would have said we're in serious, serious crisis with our food system. I actually feel much more optimistic over these past 10 years because I've seen so much change in terms of um, how people, you know, how people, not everybody in this country, but how people are thinking of eating and farmers markets and, and healthy food and so forth. There's been a lot of progress, even though there's still a lot more progress to go. And so to me, that's a, um, a, a really positive sort of evolutionary thing. And I, I really think that good ideas are what wins the day. And I think that's a good idea and people know it and they feel healthier and it's gonna win the day, right? But I do think that, um, <laughs> I sort of think the revolution is uh, some, some form of it is, is in the works here because um, when I was thinking about the next five years and what I see as the two huge, huge, huge problems of our global society is, it's climate change, and this is in the next five years, because if we don't do anything about it in the next five years, I mean, the carbon builds and stays there for decades, centuries. I mean, we've got to transform energy and economic sectors now. We can't keep waiting to do this, right? And that's why the Obama administration's going the executive route and just said, I can't wait for legislative powers to deal with this anymore. We've got to deal with it now. And that's somewhat revolutionary that he's saying, I'm not even gonna deal with the Congress anymore. Um, but the other one is inequality. I mean, it is the game changer of our times right now. And that doesn't get solved in an evolutionary way very easily. And I think there's gonna be some upheaval here, um, but it's gotta be solved because it's actually gonna bring the economy down completely, not to say nothing of our food systems if it's not solved. So um, some people aren't gonna like it as much as others, but I think just the way we tax our economy and so forth, it's, it's somewhat revolutionary. I think it's gonna have to happen actually. I actually have very little to add to that. I think that was very well put. I, having been in a revolution, I use that term very judiciously. And so people like to talk about the food revolution, you know, and I'm like, whoa, that's not how I understand it. That's not how I experienced it. Um, I think we've gone through, you know, clearly technological revolutions that have turned society, societies around the world inside out. Um, largely benefited this society, but others has, has destroyed other societies. And now sort of the chickens are coming home to roost with, you know, recession and whatnot. Um, but no, we, we're not in a revolutionary moment. I don't think, I can't think of anybody on the left that, except for some real wackos who, who, um, who try to convince people that we're just in some sort of revolutionary moment. We're not. But I think we, we may very well be in a transitional moment. Um, and that, um, in some ways, is safer um, and, uh, and maybe even more important uh, at the moment. I think that, um, you know, when I laid out Polanyi's thesis of uh, reforms, how do you usher in reforms? You need political will. You need, a, you need a boom, a crash, and then you need political will. 
you also need a threat. You need a big threat. And the, the threat was before, at, at, during the last, um, when we uh, went into the New Deal and wanted, the threat was um, afterwards, it was communism, right? I mean, basically, um, the capitalists in the United States were petrified. Uh, Roosevelt went to them and he said, look, if you guys don't turn this around, if you don't let me usher in a new deal and use the government in order to create public programs and public space to be able to save this economy for the people, um, they're all going to go communist. And that is what it looked like at the time in the streets. And at the time, the Soviet Union was a powerhouse of production and looked like it might be a very good option for people. So you had this tremendous threat um, to capitalism from communism, and the capitalists said, okay, let's, we'll go with you on this. You know, we've got rioting in the streets, um, and we have this terrible threat from communism. Let's go ahead and introduce some reforms. And of course, immediately after he did, they began to try to dismantle them. But um, I think we do have a threat, and over the next five years, I think the threat is going to become absolutely inescapable, and that's climate change. And you know, you can't really negotiate with climate change. Um, and it's getting increasingly difficult to negotiate with those who are contributing the most to climate change, which is industrial agriculture. Um, because they're desperate because of, of the recession and, and because they need returns for their shareholders, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that um, over the next five years, the conditions for creating the political will for reform are going to become much more imminent uh, and much more um, evident, which would mean, in my mind, that it's that much more important to build a powerful counter-movement in order to be able to usher in reforms and a counter-movement which is politically conscious and aware enough that they won't be duped into you know, regressive reforms or fascist reforms or the types of reforms which really work against pretty much everything we've been talking about um, at this conference. And that's where I think that it is important to know, um, to identify enemies in this process. I mean, it's great, let's keep the dialogue open and whatnot, but understand that there are plenty of people and plenty of interests out there which aren't interested in dialogue at all. And, um, and aren't interested in a good food system at all, and aren't interested in some sort of redistributive uh, notion for our, for our um, political and economic system, and aren't interested in popular democracy in any of these things. Um, and we have to know who they are, what they look like, and, and, and have to um, basically in, engage um, the public to work for something quite different. Vic, Vic do you have a question? Yeah, um, my name is Vic Izzo. Uh, I work at UVM, and I'm an educator, I guess. I also work at other colleges in, in Vermont. And one of the things that I've noticed is, from my perspective, education, what a lot of people here have said, that education is kind of one of the ways in which we can create change and create agents of change. And specifically, higher education. I haven't heard a lot of people speak about higher education, but a lot of my students who I consider when I meet them, they're agents of change, and they're really motivated. They're in school. The problem is they get out of school and they're mired in debt. And then they get into jobs that they can't really get out of, that they don't want to be working in because they're mired in debt. They get apathetic. And then eventually what they do is they kind of jump off this entire train of trying to make change. I mean, if you think of one example, if you look in the room that we're standing in right now, it's the most beautiful room on campus. And rarely will you ever see an undergraduate in this room. And so I'm just wondering if you guys have anything to say of how higher education is kind of, in my perspective, failing in some ways these agents of change that we really need to create this food system change. So I was wondering if you guys have anything to say about that. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start, because at Stanford I worry about the same thing, you know, I, the, uh, the freshmen and sophomores, even juniors that you know, I work with are so idealistic and they're gonna change the world, but when they ha get into their senior year and they need that, uh, job, you know, they're heading towards consulting or, tech, you know, it's like, what happened? <laughs> you know, a lot of them still go into that, but I've struggled over that too. What could provide the kind of opportunities? I mean, in terms of, um, you know, legislation, we've talked about um, lowering the school debt, um, 
forgiving school debt, you know, having ways of just not having that be a burden. It just doesn't seem to go anywhere politically, you know. Um, and yet, you know, it's really hard with NGOs. There's no way they can pay um, nearly as much. Like in San Francisco right now, it's, you know, it costs like $2,000 to live in an apartment with five people in San Francisco. You know, you can't even pay the rent. So it's, 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 it's such a challenge to, um, to make that, to, to make those ends meet. Um, you know, having, this is where I think the tech sector has been good in the sense that people can be, work more remotely and lower their costs from being directly in these um, necessarily high priced areas and still be very effective. And this, I had mentioned, I think yesterday, this Vermont having 3,600 NGOs that are all contributing to things and certainly engaging a lot of people, but probably doing it with pretty low overhead is, is, a, is a good strategy. But I'm sorry to say I don't really have the exact answer except to share your frustration. And I do have the answer, and it's a simple one, but uh, uh, politically challenging, and that's that uh, higher education ought to be free. It ought to be a right, just the way that public education is and health care. And that the richest country in the world has been contracting access to higher education rather than expanding it is a really shameful commentary in our society and one of the most uh, pernicious influences of our growing inequality and wealth and the concentration at the very top. There's no reason that we couldn't guarantee uh, a college education in a public institution for those people who are making satisfactory progress in this society. We have the wealth, we have the resources. What we lack is the political will, and it's moving in the wrong direction. And it's also what we need to do to fix our food system and our healthcare system and our educational system, because if we have a more uh, diverse workforce and we include in all those different workforces people from the bottom uh, 50%, 30%, 20%, 10% of our society as teachers and food workers and health professionals, those systems will become much more effective and fewer people will be dependent uh, on other forms of support. So the solution is there and we need to uh, tell our elected officials that we support that and create the political will to make it a reality. Eric, did you have a non-academic perspective? So we have two more minutes left. Uh, incidentally, I graduated from Hunter College in New York in 1959, and it was totally free, 100% free. Me too, $25 a semester. No, no, I, mine was free. <laughs> uh, <laughs> money, money. Um, so in our town, we can't dialogue, and, and I just got a call here during an interview saying we, uh, doing an intermission, saying you've got to get that woman off of our, um, off of our agriculture committee. She doesn't, have, she doesn't own land. Her 12 acres are not land. They're an investment, and she's on the committee to, to try to stop anything that we might do towards saving land. Money, when you talk, when you're in the town meetings, people, when people bring up money, they feel, well, this is the bottom line. Of course we have to make money at whatever we do. And I, 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 can't, I can't see dialogue between money is the most important thing in my life and, and the opposite of that, which is where I come from. It's the least important thing. The, the other, uh, just as a professor, the other assigned reading I was gonna give everybody is, uh, when I think about the you know, best article you've read in the past 10 years or whatever, um, for me, it's a piece by Tony Jutt um, that's called What's Living and What's Dead in Social Democracy. And what he looks at is this long period of time that we've seen, particularly in this country, um, where we've lost all our social goals and the discourse has become more oriented around economics. So every town meeting, every national discourse, it all ends out about being what are the financial costs and benefits and the financial this and that and the economic returns. And, um, and it's spoiled what we are as a society. You know, essentially, it's a really good piece. But, you know, the Europeans haven't, they still hold a certain amount of socialism in, in their countries. You know, they um, are less liberal on things like um, uh, 
homosexual relationships and marriage and things like this, but much more liberal on we're going to take care of everybody in our society. And, and in the U.S., we have gone away from that so far right now. And I, I think this is the biggest mindset. I'm glad you brought it up because I was thinking about it all day long. Um, it's the biggest change in our mindset that's making all of these discourses so difficult from, you know, everything that Nick just said on trying to, you know, put this on the, <laughs> on the political table, free education, food systems, all this kind of stuff. It's not going to work till we change, till we really change that, get away from that mindset. Um, we've had decades of it, you know, I, I'm thinking of at least since the beginning of the Reagan era when we just started having this conversation that everybody deserves, you know, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. <laughs> you know, that whole idea is, is sort of sunk in here. So I, I understand it's a good piece to read and, and I think um, it needs to start from the bottom up in terms of changing it though, in changing the discourse of it all. Um, I guess I want to end on a different note. Um, and that is that, um, I don't know if you remember during my presentation, at the very end of my presentation, there was a picture of a farm worker named Tilsi, whom we visited. He's a milker here. He's from southern Mexico. And, you know, he's about to be deported after 11 years on this farm. Um, and, I, you know, he was just indomitable. He was, his, he was so happy to see us, and he had such a great attitude. And, and you know, he, he was, um, I mean, he just had all this hope about his life, and yet his circumstances are dire. And, um, and I'm reminded about how a few things that I've learned from people like Tilsi, and, and both in this country and, and when I was abroad, but this is really hard work. And some of it's very depressing. And in fact, all, a lot of it is depressing. Um, because, you, you know, we fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and sometimes something works. And it's, it's hard to do what we're doing. Um, and nothing seems to happen fast enough. And at Food First, you know, we do all this terribly depressing analysis of the food system and then go home and have to be, you know, civil with our families. And, um, and I think that the secret to doing this is particularly for people of relative privilege, uh, like ourselves, um, is to ally with those for whom giving up hope is not an option. Because they won't let you give up hope either. Um, you'll feel quite small if you give up hope in all of your privilege next to somebody who has so much less and who is facing circumstances which are so much more difficult and simply cannot give up hope. It's not an option. There's no, there's, that this is, won't enter into it. And I think that's extremely important. And I think it's um, probably the basis, I think, for um, the fundamental alliances for social change. I think that's a, a beautiful way to end.